PD Journal, October 5th, 2015. Dr. Volskowski is serving a 20-year sentence, but the district attorney says he could get out soon with good behavior. I found a note on the windshield of my car. The note was from an anonymous source that said the mayor of Midsummer was missing and to go to the library to find the next clue. It was signed by the initials D.V. I put two and two together and got four, of course, but also I realized that Dr. Volskowski was the one who had the mayor. Dr. Volskowski was never that good of a criminal. A waste of my time, really. Though he gets good marks for penmanship. Let me go. Zip it, you whining wimp. Nobody can hear you. These walls were built to be soundproof back in the 60s when this was a lab facility. What? To silence the guinea pigs? <laughs> He'll never get away with this. As soon as you give me my money, and the police take me to the airport unscathed, then I'll release you. How is that plan going to work? You'll get caught the moment your parole officer realizes you're late and your first report in. Plus, I'm the mayor. You really think the police will let you just take me hostage? Easy. Even if I don't get my money, I'll still have a certain piece of collateral, should my plan fail. And what would that collateral be? I went to the local library. This time, I deciphered a secret code that was on a table. In the deciphered message, it said where the mayor was being held by Dr. Volskowski, how much he wanted in cash and credit, don't ask, and directions to getting there. I didn't have much time left. I needed to find Dr. Volskowski's lab. I saw a building at the top of a hill. I wasn't sure whether I came to the right place. The directions weren't very good, but then again, he'd get lost at his own jail cell. Ugh, doesn't he look ugly at night time? Christopher, what am I going to do with you? I know it was you who wrote the note and the secret code. Yes, I was the anonymous tipster. I wrote the notes and the codes too, all so I could lure you in. Anonymous? You could have put an M between D and V and make it least funny. Oh, you little... Lure? Oh, who wrote the directions to this place? Columbus? Enough! You know, we got to stop meeting like this. Tis true, tis true. But you know what I want. Great smack across the face. Oops. Slip of the hand. I've got to go get my beautiful car ready for our journey. Beautiful? Ha! It's an 85 Yugo. What's to get ready? That car couldn't move 500 feet unless it was on a hill with no brakes.
But how did you? The man can't tie a knot to save his life. Try yours. But I could have ordered Chinese food. Christopher, you won't get away with this. I'll be out soon. <laughs> well, you said that it's always Chris. And as always, Mayor, it's Christopher. And as always, another case closed. Another opens. Hi, my name is Andrew Daniluk, and I love collecting all kinds of things, comic books, cards, uh, science fiction stuff. What I miss the most out of my childhood is all the time I spend collecting things, going to stores, going to conventions, going to all kinds of different comic shops in the city and sci-fi events and shops. I had a lot more time when I was a child to be able to collect and buy things and trade things and that's what I miss the most now. So I've been working at Consumer Reports for a long time and my favorite part about my office is everything I was able to collect over the years I've been able to put around my office. So I have a lot of my collectibles whether they're posters or figurines or all kinds of sci-fi and comic book stuff. Over the years I've been able to accumulate it and add it to my office and every single year I add a little bit more and it's just a fun office to be in. People like to come visit. Every time children come into the building they love to come into my office and look at all the cool stuff that I have. So I really enjoy my office and enjoy making it like really different with all my comic and sci-fi stuff. I've been collecting comics pretty much all my life but I kind of stopped over the past 15, 20 years. I just got busy with work and my family and my kids. Um, but recently, a couple of co-workers and friends were talking about comics and mostly my boss, Jason. He started asking me about my collection and he got me really thinking about it again and really interested in bringing it out. For a long time, my comics were actually just in storage boxes and I bagged them and put them away maybe 20 years ago and I really haven't looked at them since. So this past year, I pulled all those boxes out and re-looking at all the comics and organizing them and re-bagging them and buying new cases for them and sorting them. And my favorite part was buying a database where I could actually start sorting and organize everything on my computer. The count was about 1,630 or so comics total that I had. Uh, so now I have a full collection that's cataloged and organized and it really was a lot of fun just re-looking at everything and re-tagging and enjoying the comics uh, one more time. It's a lot of Marvel, a lot of DC. Uh, my favorite comic is Spider-Man. That's the one that I started collecting first and those are the ones that I have the oldest selection of uh, late 60s early 70s they're called silver age comics um, so i have a lot of spider-man but i have all kinds i enjoyed x-men fantastic four iron man hulk there's so many different comics and then 
from those, there was Wolverine and Human Torch and The Thing and different series started popping up of all the comics. Uh, it was a lot simpler in the 60s and 70s because there really were only a few comics. When I started cataloging all the comics and going online, uh, there's a couple of websites and there's always eBay which shows the value of uh, different kinds of comics. So what I discovered as I went through every single comic, um, there were some valuable ones, mostly the ones from the Silver Age. Those are the older ones in the 60s and early 70s. And then what I did is I joined an organization called CGC. And what they do is you can mail them your comics comics and they actually professionally grade them. They go through them page by page, uh, they give a value from 0 to 10. Uh, my most, most valuable comic is probably the uh, Spider-Man 147, uh, which is the first appearance of the Punisher. Um, that's a very popular comic, uh, so that one is probably my most expensive comic right now. I also like to collect cards. I have a lot of cards, mostly from movies, so anytime a movie came out I enjoyed uh, buying the cards and then I started going to shows and trying to buy complete sets. I also have plates that I like to collect over the years. Um, I just enjoy having those plates the way they look. They look very nice on display. Uh, most of the plates I bought were from Star Trek and Star Wars. I tried to kind of get the whole set uh, from all the movies, some of the famous TV shows. So I have a lot of plates mostly from Star Wars and Star Trek as well that I like to collect past 15 years has been really amazing with how many movies and TV shows have come up uh, between Netflix and a lot of the CW and the movies obviously. It's been an amazing time after growing up as a child reading and enjoying all these comics to see them come up, come to life in these really large-scale amazing movies. Um, and it's also helped bring the interest back in comics and the value of the comics have gone up but mostly I really enjoy as a fan watching all, the, all my childhood characters come to life. Now that I've rediscovered uh, my comics and organizing them again and collecting again, uh, it's been a lot of fun now and it's like a new hobby that I have that I can now enjoy going forward, not only my entire old collection, but starting to add to my collection and maybe new comics and new series. Uh, it's like a new hobby and I'm looking forward to that.
Okay, go ahead, flush it. Now come out. <laughs> You gotta flush it, then come out. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so flush, <laughs> and then and then come out as, a, as if you just like took a shit or something. Oh, okay. Alright, so okay. one more time. I'll okay. gotta this man here. <laughs> what did I owe? <laughs> oh, yeah, and then, and then we'll get the. <laughs> I just said I find the places where they shoot movies and TV shows. I, or I could just say, hey, you ever see a TV show or a movie? You know when they're outside or at a house or something? I'm the guy that finds that. <laughs> and then they ask, how do you do that? Uh, how do you do that? Uh, we get a script and typically hold for train noise. I used to work an office job for my first probably five years after college and it didn't really vibe with me and I was looking for something different to do. I was looking into like possibly teaching or taking a fire department test and then a buddy of mine had started working as a sound guy and just seemed like a fun different sort of way. I didn't know that you could even like work on movies in New York for a living. Like, that was, I, I didn't know that was a job. And so at that point, like I started, I kind of bought a ton of books from a used bookstore on filmmaking. And I tried just like reading everything I could. And then I started making my own little movies to like learn a little bit about like editing and all that stuff. And then I started just taking, filling out Craigslist ads or not, fill, yeah, just like responding to Craigslist ads, people looking for crew members on super low budget jobs. So one day I would be a camera assistant, another day I would be a production assistant or a grip or whatever. And it was just mostly about just like getting on set experience and uh, meeting people which then led me to a couple other jobs. And I thought I wanted to be a camera guy for a while and then a woman who I knew through someone else, like I didn't know her personally, but she was a location manager and I was told she had a new job she was crewing up for and then it ended up being the third Bourne movie, the Bourne Ultimatum. And so she hired me to be a production assistant, which meant in the locations department, the production assistant basically drives a garbage van all day. They have like plumbing supplies and literal garbage cans and they set up the holding and catering areas. So like it's not a glorious job and you're the first person on set every day and you're the last person to leave set every day. but even like cleaning trash and driving around a van all the time like for 18 hours it was more rewarding than like an eight hour day of sitting in front of a computer doing database stuff i think like short of one of the top jobs like obviously directing or writing i think the job i have is the one i enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis more my favorite parts of the job is the independence that it has <clears throat> where I'm on my own all day. I don't even interact with most of the crew. A lot of the times someone will ask me if I've met a certain person that's on my jobs and my answer before they finish is no because I'm just on my own, which I, some people hate it, but I enjoy it. I also, I love taking photos. I love finding things and exploring. It's sort of the kind of thing I would almost be doing if I wasn't working. Like, when I go on vacation, I like just picking a weird spot and then exploring. So, it's sort of what I do for a living. So, that's my favorite. My least favorite uh, would probably be... Hang on, I need a second for that one. I really like my job. I mean, I wish I was rich. <laughs> the worst part is probably that in every production there comes a point where something will go wrong. There's so many moving parts to a production that any one thing going wrong can have a ripple effect that just screws up a whole day of shooting. 
and so that puts everybody into panic mode. One job I worked on early on, it started out as a movie called, I don't even know if I should give the name of it, <laughs> but I don't care. Uh, it started out called Aram Finkelstein, and it was about a character named Aram Finkelstein. And it was kind of a cute script. It was sort of this a low budget romantic comedy. But then as the production went on, it just kept changing every day. Where this was constant script rewrites. They changed the movie from Aram Finkelstein to the rebound because there was a scene that was supposed to take place at a Knicks game at Madison Square Garden, but nobody ever bothered to clear Madison Square Garden. So, like a week before we were supposed to shoot it, we found out that it was a movie called The Rebound, but we couldn't shoot at a basketball game. So it ended up being a movie called The Rebound that we had to shoot at a boxing match, but nobody on the crew really knew how to shoot a boxing match, and every day you would just look around. And like, at one point there's a self-defense class, and the teacher's in a giant lifeguard chair that you would see like a beach lifeguard in, and you would just be like, why is this happening? And like, the producers were mean, it was terrible. And the movie, I think it aired in like Asian, some Asian airline international flights. And that was the fate. <laughs> that was the only thing that ever happened to it. I always assumed early on in my career, because I was kind of lucky to work with really good people on my first few jobs, that I just kind of took for granted the fact that the people in charge know what they're doing. And so on this job, because like you would see things and they would, make you question, but then you would see the finished product and you would say, oh, now I understand what they were doing. On that job, I would look at the set every day and I would just sort of be confused at why they made the choice they did and it ended up that I was right in that instance. So that kind of taught me that not just because someone's all the way at the top of the creative food chain doesn't necessarily mean that they know everything. Which also makes you feel good when people don't choose a location that I think is good. I got to work for a lot of the people who I admire and who made me want to get into the business. Mostly the Coen brothers, uh, Martin Scorsese. I just worked for Steven Spielberg. Uh, I worked with Sasha Baron Cohen, who I always thought was pretty amazing. Yeah, so early on in my career, I worked pretty much entirely on movies. Back then, all TV shows were mostly 23 episodes. So a season of a television show shot for about 10 months. And so there was movie people that were, would take the job for say three months to like nine months, and then they would move on to a completely different job. And then there was TV people. And that to me, that always seemed like a step towards stability, which I didn't necessarily like, because you, you could work on Law and Order for 10 years. And it's pretty much like having a full-time job, whereas I like the freedom of choosing my jobs and working with different people, doing different things all the time. So I considered myself a movie guy, but now all the new streaming service stuff, it's shorter seasons. So it's kind of almost more like working on a movie a lot of the time. So, and also there's way less movies in New York just because that's the nature of the industry. Everything has moved towards streaming services, so that's, the bulk of my work now and probably the bulk of the industry, especially in New York, which has at this point I think more filming than Los Angeles. And it's and it just I think that they're just it's a lot more auteuristic a lot of the time where you're getting one person's vision and they get to tell it over however much time they want. It's not necessarily just constrained to an hour and a half. Which I think can be really cool. What I like about movies is they'll give you a script and I could have weeks to find the perfect location. Whereas with a TV show, a lot of the time you get a script and it changes five times and you're told to, you have to find something to film in two days and you have three hours to find it before the director wants to come and look at it. And just at working at a crazy pace where you're not trying to find the best thing necessarily, you're just trying to find the quickest thing. And so I like feeling like I've done, I found what I see in my head and what the director has conveyed to me is like what they have in their heads. And so usually you have that 
freedom more on movies, but on my current job, it's kind of being shot like an eight hour movie. So some locations I have, I've spent like hours finding. So that's, it's been like a good best of both world situation. The arsonist had oddly shaped feet. Sorry, you can't see my face. I can't risk him finding out who I am. Here's the situation. It's been happening for a month now and I can't take it anymore. A man who only goes by the name of Duck has driven me to complete insanity. He lives on 611 Rose Avenue in Yonkers. I am filming this in the likely event I go missing. I have reason to suspect that Duck is premeditating murder on his roommate Bill. Duck? Duck, talk to me. And uh, even after all this time, it hasn't gotten any easier. There are times where Bill is not aware of his presence in the home, and it scares Bill. Duck? Duck, please fucking answer me. Duck! He's often caught preparing for war, it seems, while he listens to punk music. The fuck? What is he doing in here? Duck? Duck! I'm worried about you! He'd often sneak into his bedroom without his knowledge to use his computer. He'd also drive his car. Duck. What the fuck are you doing? There would even be occasions where he'd come back home from doing his job with a red lobster. Where the hell were you all day? Were you just in my job as me? God damn it, Duck! And so, with all this going on, it just seems he's been plotting to kill him and take over his life. So if he turns up dead, you know where to look. Oh shit, fuck no! Oh. oh god, oh god, oh god. Oh, no, it can't be. It can't be. Is it gone? No. 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 Bill. 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 It's not real. It's not real. He's not real. Not real. Hey, babe. Is everything all right? What did Dr. Crane say? I think he thinks I'm a lost cause. He kept telling me he's not real. We'll figure it out.
I know he will. I love you.
people have high and low points in life. Right now, I'm at a low point. I, I wish I could control everything, but I can't. And I have to face what I did. I know what I did. I fucked a rotisserie chicken, but I did it because the supermarket was just paying me unfair, and I mean, paid for it anyway, so it's, it's mine. Now I'm jobless, but I appreciate both of you guys coming to listen to me. It's nice to know you have someone to talk to, you know? Yeah, I guess you're welcome. I'm glad the two of you are on board. Any advice on how to continue? Well, reaching out to others doesn't hurt. Yeah, it's a good start. Reach out to others, but I heard he of you two. Well, what we mean is anyone other than yourself. Well, I guess my girlfriend would have been a good choice, but she went missing since midnight at the bridge. Went missing? After I threw her off the bridge, she did. Okay, how about a therapist? Do you think I'm crazy? Family. Now that's... That's a good idea. Go talk to your family. I can't. Be my father to death of the printer like 10 minutes ago. So he definitely won't want to talk to me when he wakes up. We are the last two brain cells that's keeping him from ending this entire neighborhood. Aw, oh, go fuck yourself. Well, I'm sure you'll be doing that soon. Well, you're a no-good piece of shit. Well, you are talking to yourself, so yeah, you are a no-good piece of shit. Fine. I'll go to the kitchen to find better friends. He has another rotisserie chicken in the fridge, doesn't he? Yep. My name is Rafael Diloné. I'm a retired member of the New York City Police Department. I was a detective for approximately 30 years. I was involved in a lot of uh, investigations and also a member of uh, the investigative team during 9-11. My name is Scott Rubens and I'm a teacher here at New Rochelle High School. I've been teaching forensic science for 22 years and during the 9-11 disaster, I was part of the dental identification team for the New York City Medical Examiner's Office. The news, there's something going on with a plane, a plane hit into the, one of the towers, and I said, what is he talking about? He's talking, he's talking about, turn the TV on, turn the TV on, we turned the TV on, and we saw the uh, smoke coming out of the tower. I said, nah, that's gotta be an accident. It's gotta be an accident, it's gotta be a small plane. When I found out what happened, I was actually teaching uh, in this classroom, and my wife called me. And she said uh, she heard on the news that a small plane had hit the towers. So I had this little AM FM radio, and we put it on in class to listen. The and we heard what was going on. And, and the strange thing is, as a teacher, I decided, you know, what, what is it I have to do in my classroom to keep my students uh, from, from panicking? Tell, and so I kept uh, teaching. The, uh, west side, the south side, and it looks like smoke's coming from the east side as well. I thought about maybe maybe I have to go to work. I had taken that day off just to do my bathroom. 
All of a sudden I see the second plane coming around and it smashes into the second tower. And I said, oh no, this is, this is no accident. I said, I gotta, guys, I gotta go. I gotta go to work. And once the attack took place, kind of my mindset was, I wanted to go down and do something. And after looking into other venues, realized I knew people that were part of the forensic dental team and made a phone call and said, could I come down and help? And they invited me very willingly. There was a bunch of other guys there already there. But our bosses told them no, that we couldn't go because uh, we weren't uniformed personnel. We were like bloodhounds, like ready to go fight. <laughs> but uh, two or three hours later, they let us go. And we all went in, uh, in one van. So we went down to the World Trade Center. We heard some rumbling and uh, it was the towers falling down. And they said, the tower is falling, the tower is falling. And we could see it's a cloud of smoke. We all started running, running. If we didn't know where we were going, we just, we just running away. The smoke was so thick, the ashes. We couldn't see where we were going, but we just kept running, bumping into each other. Yeah, I think everybody was scared. But at that time, I don't think you could feel fear itself. You were running and your adrenaline was pumping so high. And we're used, we're used to running into situation, not away from situation. So that was weird in a sense. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about uh, being scared. I don't think there was time for, to be scared. We were just running away because of the situation. Because the tower was falling down, you don't want to get trapped. So you run away. You know, you live to fight another day. The uh, situation in New York, I believe it was changed forever. A lot of anger, a lot of depression. Uh, people uh, were just very upset, angry at what had taken place and uh, they made it worse that they targeted a specific group and th this group happens to be the Muslims and uh, people want to go to war, people want to destroy. See when I went back I was doing the investigation and uh, a lot of the calls were uh, calls against neighbors who were Muslims you know so you went and interviewed them. You follow leads. It wasn't. It was unfair that, that they were made targets of the investigation because they were Muslims. They were innocent. They were just regular family. You know, they they pray and they did everything. Just it just happened that no matter what ethnic background you are from, people are good and people are bad. I think the attacks affected the community, you know, a lot like most other big things. If you watch any big city or any group of people, people pull together. Um, and while there was some division of people because of that, and then looking at other people in ways you might not want them to look at them, lots of people came together. Civilians came down, the steel workers came down, first responders came from all over the country, some of them on their own dime. People drove from California. Um, I saw police cars from Colorado and from Atlanta. I know firefighters came from Australia and they paid their own way. So I think everybody really, everyone came together. There were lots of people physically trying to rescue people, leading people out, providing emotional support afterwards. Um, so I think to watch it when you kind of could step back from it a little while, uh, you really could see how people came together. It was a very emotional experience, um, whether you're working in the morgue on remains or whether you're trying to make identification and you can't find an identification. I had no problem, I was all together, but there were a number of nights on the way home I had a good cry. The American people were never as close as they became after 9-11 because there was so much love and help and sympathy for those people that were hurt, for the family that were lost, uh, that you never saw that. I never saw that in all my life here. I never saw so much caring and so much love pouring from every corner of the community of the American citizens in, in this country. People from all over the United States, all over the world. So many people that we had to turn people away. 18 years later, you know, uh, that. Uh, that feeling of anger has subsided somewhat. As people need to be together.
no matter what uh, background you, you come from. Uh, a community is a community, it means that people help each other out, look out for each other, respect each other. New York will never be the same. It's not because people aren't scared anymore. You know, people just got used to the idea that things are going to happen. Working with these people on the forensic dental team who treated me as an equal, who were the most wonderful, intelligent people with whom you can work, we, we, we bonded together. I uh, had a great time uh, protecting the community of New York. And uh, if I had to do it again, if it was my choice to do it again, I'd do it all over again.
somewhere east of the Mississippi, there's a town. That town's called Portchester. And in that town called Portchester, there's a man. That man's name is Jimmy. Now Jimmy, what we call here in Mississippi, we call him a pothead. Jimmy likes to smoke some weed. Now we have Jimmy laying in the park, enjoying the weather, smoking his weed. Now what weed does, it makes you think, it makes you have questions. In Jimmy's mind right now, he has a ton of questions. Like, did we ever land it on the moon? Is Obama a Muslim? Who killed Biggie? And who killed Tupac? Ah, what are we saying? Tupac's still alive in Cuba. The biggest question on Jimmy's mind, well, why do people smoke weed? Why do I smoke weed? Um, I smoke weed because it makes me feel good. It also helps me sleep. Um, when I'm stressed out, it, uh, it's kind of just there sometimes. Uh, I do want to find better ways to handle my stress and all that stuff, but like, especially now I'm young, I can do that stuff. I can almost, I don't want to say take the risk, but live life and do what I want. I'm a fucking baller. Why do I smoke weed? I smoke weed because it's fun. Um, mainly I like to smoke weed because it's not always the feeling of when I'm high, it's more of who it makes me when I'm sober. It's like I feel like I'm a different person. Everyone who smokes weed just has like that thing about them that's like, oh, they know, they got it. Why do I smoke weed? Like, you know, it's just, it's, it opens my mind to a lot of shit that I wouldn't know without it, if that makes any sense. So why I smoke weed? I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, why would it you? Like, it just makes everything better, man. Makes food taste better, makes sex feel better somehow, I don't know how that's possible, but it's, it's true, man. All right, so why do I smoke weed? Um, I smoke weed because uh, I just like to get high. Like, I like the feeling, the feeling is good. Like, I like, I just need to smoke, I like smoking weed. Like, I don't know, I, I need it. Like, <laughs> I don't be knowing what to say for these, but I need it. Why do I smoke weed? because it's illegal and I like to do hood rat shit with my friends. Why do I smoke weed? 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 Why I smoke weed? Why do I smoke weed? Because I love it, you know? It makes me feel like like good. It's an escape from reality. Take your mind off what's going on. It clears my mind and stuff. I feel like it helps you just know what's good. I'm in a good mood all the time when I do it. Weed is pretty fire and I'd recommend it to my friends and loved ones. Why do I smoke weed? Why do I smoke weed? Ah, who gives a fuck? I need to smoke another blunt. Well, if you're wondering why Jimmy smokes weed, well, there you go. There's your answer. He just doesn't give a damn. He's just a man in the town, somewhere east of the Mississippi. And he just does what he wants to do. We'll see you in another journey. Another reefer smoker kind of thing in a movie, you know, in a town. 
east of the Mississippi with a man. I'm just rambling now. I'm going to go now. Maybe smoke some of the weed that Jimmy's be smoking. I'll talk to you guys later. So, (laughs) that's a loaded question. I get up at 5 a.m. Um, I'm out of the house by 5.35, 5.40 to go catch the Metro North into Grand Central. Um, and I catch the subway down from Grand Central down to Lower Manhattan World Trade Center. I spend four hours a day com- commuting. Um, I have a very hectic day usually. Lots of meetings, lots of international meetings, UK, Manila. Um, I have a high pressure job. I try not to bring it home. I go a lot to the UK, usually go there several times a year. I go to Manila at least once a year to travel to Nashville and Mexico, Canada um, for work. When you and your sister were little, there were trips where I was gone for three weeks at a time and you guys would cry on the phone. It was horrible. It was so horrible. Mommy, when are you coming home? I worked on a lot of projects that would keep me away from home for weeks at a time and that was, it, that's tough. Traveling for business is not, everybody thinks it's glamorous. It's not. You're away from your family. You're away from your comforts of home. Your um, dad was an alcoholic. I put up with it for a very long time. And um, you and your sister were getting older. And I felt very strongly about the fact that it wasn't okay. And if I stayed in that relationship, you guys would think it would be okay. Um, to have that kind of life and that wasn't okay. We've been separated for at least eight years and divorced for six, I believe. I was um, the breadwinner and had to do most of the chores in the house and work a full-time job while we were married. The first time, I guess you were about a year old, we talked and he was gonna get help and. Um, And then he hid it very well for many years. The second time was probably, I want to think your sister was maybe four. So you were probably about eight. And of course I felt bad and um, allowed him to come back again. And then the third time was the last time. He was driving around in a car that was in my name and drunk. And I thought I could lose everything I worked so hard for, you know? It wasn't okay, the life was not okay. And he chose alcohol over his family multiple times. Some people are physically abusive and he never was, but uh, verbally abusive was, you know, I I was very beaten down um, mentally. I was a parent, a single parent. Um, I was already paying for everything on my own anyway and trying to make a way. It was trying to make sure that you and your sister were taken care of. Um, that there was coverage because your sister was a bit younger. You were just starting high school. Um, But it was making sure that there was somebody to get her off the bus and make arrangements and business trips and who's going to stay with you guys. And and the other part was finding myself again. You get kind of lost in people's addictions. I had to spend a good probably three years just trying to figure out who I was again, Um, apart from being mom, you know, who was Mary Ann. The older you guys get, the harder it is, um, the more expensive it is, I should say. I think financially is the only thing that always worries me and making sure that you and your sister have everything that you need. That's probably my biggest worry most of the time. If I didn't have a lot of really good people around me, I probably would have went in a corner and cried all the time. I cried a lot, but (laughs) um, yeah, I probably would have did that more. You kind of resign yourself to the fact that it's never gonna be exactly the way you want it, right? Not even perfect, but exactly the way you want it. You you learn to compromise with what's really important and what's not. And so my first priority is always you guys. And I feel bad sometimes that you guys have burdens on you financially. The second time I threw you that out, that would have been the last time. So there wouldn't have been a third time. So you would have been much younger. Uh, You were probably eight, maybe seven or eight. Um, And she was four, maybe. So that would have probably um, impacted our lives quite a bit. You, you need to enjoy your life, but you also need to plan. 
right? So being prepared financially, meaning think about what you want to do in the next three years and making sure you have money put aside for it. You're really good at that. Um, your sister, not so much. And I think it's just always making sure that you're prepared. I went through stages in my life at your, around your age, around 23, where I was just kind of spending money and being a little goosey-goosey with money. So um, I think I probably would have saved knowing what I know now. So my advice to you guys would be to plan and think ahead. You don't have to plan your whole life out, but think about what you really want and what you really want to do in life and think things that you want to see and go vacations and plan for them and um, put the money to the side little by little. You know, you might not be able to do it in a year, but maybe in three years or two years or 10 years. Um, and always know what your priorities are and don't, um, don't compromise them for anyone. Um, follow your dreams, pretty much. Welcome to How To Make A How To Video. Follow along with the upcoming steps and you'll be guaranteed to have a remarkable how to video in no time. Step one, decide what it is you want to demonstrate how to do. I want to demonstrate how to make a how to video. Brilliant. Step two, create a script and a shot list that will help you keep track of all the things you want to say within the target direction of the video. This shot list? No, not that shot list. This shot list. Step three, acquire a recording device and record footage of you demonstrating the process. Action. I want to demonstrate how to make a how-to video. Outstanding. I want to Step four, import the footage into a video editing software and organize each clip sequentially. Look at you go. Step 5. Record a voiceover of yourself giving verbal instructions to clarify and highlight specific details of the process, like this. Congratulations! With this fifth and final step, you will find that you have created a stellar how-to video. If you told me your video was shot by Kubrick, I wouldn't believe you. Because it's better. You have ascended light years above Kubrick, Scorsese, Spielberg, and even you win. That's right. You're a genius. What's this? You've been nominated for 30 Oscars. But that's not enough. The Academy has decided to award you every single Oscar. Well deserved. You've been solidified as one of the greatest filmmakers of our time thanks to the never-ending stream of praise garnered by your video. The video you made off of my back. You thought I'd forget? You would be nothing without me. I created you, and I can destroy you. Thank you for watching. We hope <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this video. If you are still struggling to understand the topics discussed, please refer to our how to watch and fully comprehend a how to video on how to make a how to video video. <sighs>
this dress was not me. This uh, skirt, this uh, this type of behavior that my parents expected me to be because I was their little girl was not me. From a young age, I realized that I've always felt like a boy. My whole identity was based on masculinity, I guess, as a young age, but that changes over time. But still, my outlook, the way I saw myself, the way I carried myself, I always thought of myself as a young boy. Growing up, I realized maybe I could give this girl thing a try because maybe, I don't know, maybe I just was, maybe I was just going crazy or something. And I convinced myself that I was probably going crazy. But I never, ever forget, like, the feeling. The feeling was always there no matter what I do. By the age of maybe 12, I did my research. I googled um, girl turns to boy. And it usually gave me, like, videos of maybe, like, Jerry Springer, uh, people on themselves as transgender to their girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever. For me, then, a YouTube channel, Skylar Kurjo, pretty much was the first trans person I've ever seen him transition. His transition started from 2009 to current times. And his whole documentary of transitioning, and I learned all these new words, and I realized that this was me. After doing my research, I didn't just hop on and say, oh, I'm going to transition. Like, no, I, I didn't. I had to, like, really, really think this through if this was really me. Even though I believed so hardly that it was, I had to really make sure. So I played around, uh, dressed up with more boys clothes, even though um, this was around the time puberty hit and I was really sad about that, like really sad. I didn't like the fact that I was going through regular female puberty. I didn't like anything that to do with it. I hated on the street every single time. The cat calls the, the amount of, the amount of boxing up that they put me in like, just being a girl, this is what you have to be, this is what you have to do, and it's just not me. I finally managed to tell my mother that I may be transgender. She cried. She thought that I shouldn't be that because I was not supposed to be because God intended me to be this way and whatever, and my parents are really Catholic. My father, however, my father, he was... He wasn't really there in my life like that, but he was in a way. But at the same time, he didn't care because he still loved me. So he said, let let her be a boy. And by the time I turned 16, I researched for a clinic. I was fully, I pretty much identified for a male for two years after that. And my mother didn't know that I was searching for a clinic yet. I searched for a clinic in New York City and... I was given the chance to start testosterone at the age of 16. Of course, they went through some, you know, medical practices and conditions to check if, you know, this is really my thing, my choice that I want to do. To my choice to transition, if this if if my choice of transition is what I want to do, I start transitioning at 16, and I've documented my life in a way, my transition. I've documented. Um, many parts of my life. I've documented my art. My art transitioned with me. It's hard being transgender. I wouldn't wish this on my evil enemy either. The hardest thing about being transgender is no matter what you do, people would believe you're living a delusion like a schizophrenic, that you're a disease, that we should be dead. And it's just not fair because they don't know what we go through. They don't know what's happening in our heads. And they can't relate why should anybody be the judge of how should we live based on their beliefs when their beliefs has nothing to do with the way our lives are set up being transgender is really hard you could lose family members you could lose your job you could lose you know in all the chances and opportunity just for being trans and people are seriously dying in this world just for being themselves but i think i'm lucky I think this is probably the best decision in my life I've ever made. And I'm very grateful for it every single day. And this is my voice four weeks on testosterone. Two months on T, I'm sorry. Why did I start like that? But you know what, we're just gonna continue the video because... So, today is, well, 
technically today is one day after my three months on tea. So it's four months on tea for me. I just recently turned four months. It's today, the seventh of every month. I guess it's tomorrow's supposed to be my six months on tea. And I don't know, I really don't have much to say. Hello. It is my eight months on testosterone. Today is my well, a little over ten months on tea. Hey, beautiful. Uh, what are you doing home so early? Well, actually, that's what I want to talk to you about. Wait a second, what's, what's that? Where are you going? Alison? 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 Alison, let's talk. Alison, what's going on? Alison, please, talk to me. Open the door so we can talk. Alison? There's nothing to talk about. Well, I'm not going anywhere until you talk to me. Well, then I guess you're going to be there for a little while because I have nothing to say. Yes, there is. The bag and... And there's something I need to get off my chest. Well, what about last night? I asked you to be here last night so we could talk. I'm sorry, Alison. Something came up. It was A work thing. Yeah. I've heard that before. How many work things can someone possibly have? Do you think I'm stupid? Like, I'm really gonna believe that every time? Alison, not this again. How many times am I gonna tell you there's no one else? It was a work thing. Why don't you believe me? How am I supposed to? You're never here. This is the first time we've talked in weeks. What are you talking about? I live here. I'm here every night. Oscar, we don't talk. We never talk anymore. You come in here at night to sleep, and that's it. And coming in here to sleep? That doesn't mean that you're actually here with me. I go to bed before you come in, and when I wake up, you're already gone. Clearly, other things matter more to you. Alison, I could never do that to you. I love you so much. I know I've been busy a lot and that we can barely see each other, but I could never do that to you. I love you. You know me. I'm sorry. But I'm here now and we can talk. Please, just open the door so we can talk. Please. Oscar, I'm sorry, but I am tired of feeling like I'm unimportant. When night after night I come home and you're not here, it hurts. And when night after night I get into bed alone, it hurts. And when you say you have to go to a work thing but you come home smelling like a bar, it hurts.
I love you and I miss you. But if you're not going to be here with me, then what's the point? Alison... I'm so, so sorry. I swear all the long hours were for us. I... I know this was bothering you, but I didn't realize it was bothering you this much. If I knew... I'm sorry, and, and the drinking was just a release to get away for a second, but I know it, it was wrong, and that's all on me. If I could change it all, I would, but I can't. But I promise I'll change, I'll be better, I'll be home more, and I won't let this ever happen again. Because I love you so much. What's that? Um... Uh, I... I know that you said because of your dad that you don't want kids and stuff. And I haven't even thought about what I'm gonna do or if I can keep it and if you don't want it then... Stop, stop, just stop one second. I had a whole thing planned out, but I just can't wait anymore. I love you so much, and I want everything with you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Alison, will you marry me? My name is Roseanne Wellmaker, better known as Ro. We're in Central Islip, New York at Rose Glass World. I've always been interested in some sort of artistic expression in the sense that I grew up around art, uh, so I was always doing something, either uh, family projects or things on my own, but it was always something that was nurtured as I was growing up. I was in my teens, early 20s. I was making jewelry, selling it to friends. Um, and co-workers, neighbors, and making for gifts. And I saw um, that the beads that I was buying were expensive, and I always felt like, you know, I should be able to do this. Why, why do I have to spend all this money buying these beads? I should be able to do it myself. Of course, I didn't have the time. I was working, whatever. Um, and I used to make some of my beads. I would make them out of paper. Um, in college, I took uh, sculpting uh, in clay, and I couldn't, when I opened the vat of clay, and it was... I couldn't deal with my hands being dried out all the time. So it was like physically, I just couldn't do it. It was moldy, it was, eh, it was not good. When I was older than that, and I was maybe about to retire, I went to Urban Glass for an open house. And you got to try your hands at everything. So you could do lamp work, you could do sculpt, hot glass sculpting in the hot shop, you could do sandblasting. So I did that, and everything I did pretty much came pretty easily to me. It was right around my birthday. I believe, and my mom was with me, and she got me this little startup kit, and it was like a couple of rods of glass, a pair of glasses, a little torch that went on a map gas canister, you like from Home Depot or a hardware store, um, and I think I got a video too. And I came home and watched the video. I'm like, oh, okay, that's how you make a cat, that's how you make a dog, and I immediately was able to do every little thing on there. So of course, then the map gas canister got to be not hot enough and not strong enough and not big enough for what I wanted to do. So then I had to upgrade my torch and then I had to upgrade the studio. So that's happened probably five or six times. Um, 
And then just through the years of working, uh, people have always asked me to teach um, or to show them how to do something. I'm, I was always a teacher in some way, shape, or form throughout my life in different areas. And um, so now I also teach glass classes. I'm a tool fanatic. See, me, my husband's a, a helicopter mechanic and we go into a hardware store or we go to a trade show with him with all the tools and the two of us are like, oh, kids in a candy store. Love tools my whole life. When I was a kid, I used to sit on the workbench with my dad and I would sit and hand him and I'd have to learn all the names of all the tools. God forbid I hand the wrong one. So, you know, I had to learn all that. So I think I started really like little, like three, four, five, you know, with this thing about tools and how cool tools were. And now everywhere I go, I'm like, ooh, can I use that for glass? Ooh, will that melt? What's that made of? Um, so I have now many tools that I use. Um, wear Kevlar gloves so that my arm isn't hot. I have uh, holding fingers to hold cups and goblets to make it easier to make attachments. Um, I have a hand torch so that I can hold the piece and get into tight spaces as opposed to trying to, you know, manipulate a large sculpture in front of the torch that's mounted on the bench. Um, you know, there's many, many of the rod racks, you know, I can use a brick. <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of things that I have that I don't really need, but, you know, the main things are that you need a torch, you need a pair of two of tweezers, uh, safety glasses, you cannot do it without safety glasses, um, and maybe some kind of a knife or an X-Acto knife. And pretty much you could get away with quite a bit doing that for a very long time. I think glass sculpting, as opposed to other media, is attractive to people because it has an air of mystery about it. They don't exactly know, I mean, no matter how many videos and whatever you see, it's, it is this hands-off, can't touch the medium kind of a thing that's not so popular. And I think the transparency of it and the sparkle, the way it catches the light, not that there aren't paintings that do that. There are some people that really can catch uh, the atmosphere and fog and light and sun and things, but the way glass reflects things and also transmits color um, it, or transmits just light, even if it's clear, um, is, is mesmerizing to people. You know, when you look at a piece of glass sculpture, it, it's just every little part of it is mesmerizing, whereas it's... Um, I think it's the mystery of, of it a lot is what attracts people to it. You know, I mean, painting, I think people can imagine a little bit easier the process of doing a painting and somebody having the skill, obviously, to see something that they, you know, paint something that they see is an amazing gift. But they can comprehend how that happens. But with glasswork, unless they really see how it happens, they can't really imagine it. So I think that's part of what attracts people to it. It's the mystery. I like to see people's reactions to my work be what I intended, what I felt as I was doing them. Either as I was making it, it was funny, and I'm laughing, I'm you know having a grand old time making something that's going to bring joy to someone. What if the piece is maybe introspection, um, and that when they look at it, they react like that? So I do like to, that, that is success in a piece. When somebody sees what I felt at the time making it, I'm good. For me, I still enjoy like the feel of glass. It's like honey and gooey and, you know, with the tools, I can feel through the tools. I, I just, I love it. And it's sparkly. I mean, how could you pass that up?
everything was perfect back then. Nothing would ever separate us. But then... It all fell apart. know how I start my day if you're going to understand my story. It's not something everyone experiences, like, well, it's an all breath, brushing their teeth, taking a shower. For me, it's the beginning. The beginning of brilliance. Uh, action. Yeah. Sorry, um, we dated for like a year, maybe, I don't know, something like that. So, Nikki is like the love of my life. We've been dating two years and she's just my best friend. Everything is perfect and I mean, well, not everything. She just broke up with me, but like, I know I can win her back. Why? He was kind of cool at first. He makes these films. He thinks they're all deep and mysterious, but really, they're terrible. And kind of cliche. So I've only been able to communicate with her over the phone, not like calling or anything, but just continuous texting like back and forth. I mean, you know how texting works. Everyone's on their phones now. I mean, like, there's no face to face or personal connection anymore. It's just, it really is terrible. It's okay that I'm doing it though, because I'm in some serious shit right now. So, like, yeah, but something needs to change. Nikki, what the fuck? Give me five. Yo, my man. Ha <laughs> ha. Right. Thank you for your service. I'm all for diversity. What the fuck is this? After two years, it's a fucking day later, you already have a new guy? <sighs> no. He's hot, and I have needs. And what the fuck is this? Another one of your stupid movies? Stupid? I thought you liked my art. <laughs> art? What? Art, your stupid movies? Ugh. Your parents are right. You'll never make any money. That's real low. That's real low because you know my parents don't understand me, so they can't get me. And that makes them hate me, and they act like I'd be better off dead. Well, maybe they're onto something. Well, you know what then? Maybe I will. Maybe I will do it. Maybe I will kill myself, and then you'll see the. They'll all see! It's kind of cliche, isn't it? God damn it! Roman, come on! Well, that didn't work out. Why'd you say you're gonna kill yourself? I mean, this is really sad, and I'm really sad right now, so I think I'm just gonna kill myself because of how sad I am right now. Really? 
now I couldn't come up with a better ending. Listen up and I'll tell a story About an artist growing old Some would try for fame and glory Others are On my way home, I can see the autumn leaves falling Everyone from the trees in which represents the downward spiral that my life is going through right now. The leaves that are still hanging represent what I'll be doing to myself now. Why are you so odd? We don't really like what you do. We don't think anyone ever will. Problem that you have. Do it. Gonna do it. Oh. I should make sure she's here first. Hey, it's me. Jack. What do you mean deleted my number? Never talk to me again. What? No, 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 never mind that. I'm sitting here with the fucking noose around my neck. Okay, and what? What? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. What the fuck do you mean? Yes, I. Hold on. You get it? Yeah. Yeah, I told you. Yeah, I'm gonna fucking do it. Well, okay. See you then. She's coming. Fuck, I was playing Mario Kart. You're here? Yeah, I'm still gonna do it. Well, come look at my window. Alright. Hey, are, are you really going to be doing this? Is that, I just... Of course not, but once she sees that I'm serious, she's gonna love me again and take me back. I told you I was gonna win her back. Oh my fucking god, he's serious? Nikki, I love you too much to go on without you. If you won't have me back, I just... I, I can't, I can't live anymore. Honestly? That's kind of badass and hot that you would kill yourself for me. But uh, don't get me wrong, I in no way, shape, or form love you or want to be with you. But I could fuck you one last time. That creep with the camera has got to go though. Oh shit, bro, you heard her get the fuck yeah. out of here, yeah. man. Right. Yeah. Uh, come. Yeah. Jack? Jack! Jack! Oh Holy my god! Shit. Jack! Oh, fuck, 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 Holy shit. Jack! Holy shit. and I'll tell a story about an artist growing old some would try for fame and glory others aren't so bold honestly dude that thing's a piece of shit 
told you, not enough symbolism. Shit. Why are you so odd? We don't really like what you do. We don't think anyone ever will.